very um okay so this week is building a model from scratch in python so in the i think two videos ago he built a model from scratch in excel um so i tried to um think of a way to present this material because um, there wasn't a lot of content. So let's just see what I did here. Um, I'm gonna present it from this way. So this is building a tabular model from scratch, the Titanic data. And the first part of it is data cleaning. So what I tried to do was do everything he did in Python and R. Um, I only got so far until he started using the grad function and then um, I stopped. <laughs> uh, but so yeah, so we're using this Titanic data from Kaggle. Um, there's a clean notebook from the GitHub for the course. So So if you go on the fast book, I believe, yeah, the clean folder is here. Um, actually, this isn't the right one. This is for the book. This one. This GitHub repo. Fast course. Okay, here. Um, he was writing this in paper space. I downloaded the notebook and I uploaded it onto Kaggle in the Titanic project. So because I tried it in Google Colab, but this didn't work um, because I probably needed some install some pot um, packages or something. Okay, so that's getting started. Yeah, basically what he did was he read in the data, the training data, and started talking about the missingness. And when you're working with this in R, there is this caveat that some of the missing data is coded with an empty string. So when I was working through this, getting to the dummy variable section, I had dummy variables for, you know, empty characters. And so if you use read.csv, um, the default behavior doesn't catch it, but with underscore, the default behavior catches those NAs. So we have these different, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, right? So whether or not a passenger survived on the Titanic based on um, their basically ticket class, sex, age, I think some family information, um, a cabin and embarking. So there's a lot of missing data in the cabin, which probably is related to what ticket they had. Um, and so the first thing he talked about is you have to decide what to do with the missing data um, because the neural network, right, it needs all numbers. Um, so his quote from the video is he doesn't throw out rows, which I can agree with, but he said he also doesn't throw out columns. Um, and I guess that's fine for this example, but there might be some columns you don't really need. Um, or there might be better feature engineering between um, if cabin is like a subset of maybe the ticket type or the class type um, there. Yeah, I can't so remember he, how how big is this data set? It's like eight hundred and ninety. Yeah, it's, so that's it's small. <laughs> so that's a lot of missing. For uh, the cabin, yeah, in the age. There, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I definitely don't want to get rid of the rows because you would have, you know, nothing left. <laughs> um. So. In Python, he imputed the data with mode, and I realized that I've never tried to calculate a mode in R. 
because I tried to use a mode function and it just gives you like, is it numeric? Like the, the mode of the data type, not the statistical mode. <laughs> um, and because cabin is a character, I couldn't just use median. So basically I have this, I did a little bit of digging and um, looked around and just said, okay, if it's numeric, I'm going to use the median. Otherwise, um, the label with the highest frequency, if it's not. And so here... Yeah, um, I mean, label with highest frequency is the mode, right? So I mean, you could, yeah. you could have just done unique right. on all of these and taken the first yeah. one sorted or something, I guess. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, it's common to use the mode for... Uh, character type variable it, uh I haven't really seen that much with with numeric columns so yeah that seems like a bad idea to me especially if you got like a bunch of zeros in there or something like yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. it was probably just one of those like lazy design choices he just wanted to illustrate he said, the point. I mean, he, said it he, was, he so. called out a lot in the video like i'm just gonna do everything lazy yeah for now yeah um, which, okay which makes sense i think from his philosophy i think it was in this course right like doing the end-to-end -end and then um iterating cleaning it up later yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah he said the mode good enough for the baseline method um and so uh in the tidy deep layer you have this replace underscore na which is uh is column wise replacement of na so you have to have a list um for each column, what you want to use. So then I have this map in here. Um, okay, so this is doing the imputation. And then this is just checking if any of them have any NAs anymore. No, some summary here. So yeah, we have a few, so ticket, a few character variable. Is there anything else I wanted to say about this? I don't think so. The next thing on cleaning the data um, was about skewed data. So fair, right, is a positive number, which we know tends to be right skewed like this because it's bounded by zero. Usually prices um, are skewed like this or income. Um, and so we can do this log transformation. And if there's any zeros, you can add a constant um, to the log to make it more symmetric. So it looks like, yeah, there probably maybe was a few tickets that were zero dollars over here. This is one thing, I don't know if this has come up for y'all. I, I work with count time, count data sometimes. And um, sometimes if you don't pick a, like you can see it here, the offset may induce outliers in the transform space. So you can play around with this offset a little bit to get it um, not to be mm -hmm. so negative. Or <clears throat> not negative, but so far. I don't know if that, that's what this is. I'd have to double check, but I guess log of one is zero, so maybe not. We don't have any negative. Okay, anyway. I thought it was a little a little weird that we were even uh, applying the log transform here, right? So I, I watched the video. Just want to make sure I've <laughs> I uh, watched the right one, but aren't we building kind of decision trees here? And um, um, at the end, yet. he goes yeah. into that. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Right now, we're just doing um, a neural net. I think People next right, week is net. the decision trees. And yeah. But he got into it at the very end. That, like, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, it's yeah. at the end. Okay. But you're yeah. right. For decision trees, you don't need to do this, right? Right, because so. it's a monotonic yeah. transformation, so it doesn't mm -hmm. really have an effect. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. It, so, yeah, this is a, um, a recommendation for the neural net. Okay. And then the last thing is dummy variables. So I did try this first with um, model.matrix. With a formula, I can, um, let's go. Here are some of our characters. We have the classes and how they embarked. 
first I did try this with model dot matrix. So what did I do? I think I did like DF select um, these model dot matrix. And I had this formula minus one thinking like, okay, if I don't have an intercept, it will give me all of the levels. But for some reason, um, what did I do wrong here? No typo. Oh yeah. Oh wait, I remember. You have to specify the argument name because this pipe. Um. For some reason, yeah. Even with the. Let me just do the head. The no intercept. I wasn't. Getting yeah. You know, oh wait, and I need to mutate. I should have just kept this in there. Yeah, P class and embarked, it still drops levels. So I got both the levels for the sex, but. Yeah, anyway. That's an interesting thing because you, this is actually the right way to do it, in my view. I don't, it's redundant. It's like, it adds all kinds of additional cooling areas when he puts, leaves all, all the levels, like, Male, female, mm -hmm. one, two, and three, C, Q, and S, mm -hmm. right? If you were using a normal, if you were doing like a standard, like logistic regression with that, you'd have all kinds of problems, right? If you left all those in there. Yeah, but 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 the, you could still find a solution with having the, the redundant columns here, right? And I've heard the argument that, you know, this can be more interpretable, including it, including those redundant columns, but I, I don't know. I, I don't have a, a great feel for it, but I've I've heard arguments both, both for and against. Yeah, so... If you don't have a constant term, then you shouldn't have a singular design matrix or non-singular, whatever the term is. Yeah, yeah. Even if you include one, two, and three uh, C, Q, and S as well? Yeah, as long as um, like those aren't functions of each other. Like I guess that's nested. right. Yeah, right. But you don't need to have them, I guess, the other way to say it. No, yeah. Um. Anyway, so I tried to do it with model that matrix because I didn't want to manually define all of these. Um, as you can see, my quick, I mean, I only spent like half an hour on this. So I was like, okay, I give up. And then I found there's this package fast dummies. So you just use fast dummies, to make dummy columns. Um, and then, yeah, we have the, all of them. And it's kind of nice because it puts them with the same labeling as the one in the Jupyter notebook with the underscores. Yeah. And then um, you, for the function for the um, neural network, I think it, they separate out, right? So like in R, we might use formula notation, but here we're just going to subset. Um, the de dependent survival from the independent variables. And yeah, so we have, this is back to your question, there's 891 cases and we subset only to these um, variables. So it's just a coincidence that the name, I'm first like, oh, is that some kind of special thing for doing with the fast AI package with R? No, it's just a coincidence, I just looked it up. <laughs> they probably were like, oh, <laughs> I can steal this idea. I don't know. I think it's supposed to be faster. Like and yeah, I think it's faster than model dot matrix yeah. if you look at the package. Um, okay, and then I could do the initialization. So I have the seed, and then he initializes random uniform um, with a mean of zero. So we subtract 0.5. Oh, let me get this going here. And then he talks, has a discussion about broadcasting, which we know we also have in R. The thing, though, in R is it is um, column major and not row major. So initially, I was <laughs> forgetting this and doing my matrix times my coefficient. And I was like, um, 
why is my loss like five times not even no like 10 times his loss and then I remembered um that it's a different major order so to do it with the broadcasting you have to transpose and then transpose again which is kind of annoying so I think later on I just switched it to the um matrix multiplication So yeah, so we have their independent variables times our random coefficients. And this, uh, looking at this led to the discussion of, okay, you can see right away that these are not on the same scale with when you look from column to column, right? So age, we have, mm -hmm. you know, what, six, negative 11 and sibling um, decimals. And so when you do the gradients, the gradients will be on different scales. So you can't really have like one step size and move all of the coefficients um, because it will have different meanings. So you can normalize, all right? And the two most common ways are dividing by the maximum. So you can get between zero and one or subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation, which I, for me, it is more common in my work, the second one, um, which would just be using the scale function on the, on the matrix. Um, but mm -hmm. here I have the just dividing by the max. Okay, and then when we look now at the product, now we can see they're roughly on the same scale. Okay. Um, the last thing is to decide on a loss function. So for in this section, he just uses the absolute error, and here you can see I just switched back to matrix multiplication, so I don't have to double transpose. So the predictions are right, just the matrix multiplication of your independence and your coefficient vector. We it doesn't matter that this is. Um, not a matrix, or we'll interpret this right as a column, a column vector. So this is valid uh, matrix multiplication. And then the loss is roughly, this is roughly the same order that he had in the notebook. And then um, we save the useful functions for repetition. And that's as far as I went with the R code. Um, and I'll probably switch over to the notebook just to have a look. So then he starts training the linear model. And let me just switch because there's not that many notes here. I might have to run a bunch of these. I suppose you could have tried to continue on with uh, Torch for R, right? <laughs> yeah, I could have. Well, I thought he was going to like, you know, do gradient descent by hand. <laughs> so I just, thought like, oh, I can do this in R, but then um, let me just go faster here. No, keep going. Um, and there was one thing I posted in Slack. You do have to change, you have to cast this as a float because this tensor function no longer works on NumPy arrays. Okay. Yeah, I mean, do you see my comment about that? the The issue yeah, is I... the issue is actually further up when he does oh, okay. the uh, uh, the dummies because the dummies now do true and false instead of numbers. So you can have to, you can also fix ah. it by putting a flag on the get dummies to say as type float, and then the values thing won't have any trouble making it. The problem happens when you convert to value when you do the values thing on the uh, inside there. Where that error was at? <laughs> it was this one. So it's this? Yeah, when well, you do values, because some of them are Booleans and some of them are numbers, it doesn't know how to... So values turns the data frame into a, a NumPy array, as you said. And what happens is that the NumPy array can only be of one type. And so it says, okay, I guess I have to be object uh, now. And object, it doesn't okay. work for... So this answer. is not all one type. So right. this... Yeah. Okay, okay. So you don't need the as type float there if you were to use it up. Well, you can see right above there, you see the true, false, true, false. That's different than what was mm -hmm. what he was doing. It was all ones and zeros. And, but it's easy enough to fix that. Uh, so. so here you're saying you could do Yeah, like you just do D, comma, D type. 
yeah, you can try gamma D type equals float. Uh, actually, you probably can't do that now because you've already modified the data frame. It'll just yeah. be there now. So that's one of the problems. He keeps redefining yeah, the thing. You yeah. can't like go back and yeah. start all over the top again. Keep running that. Yeah, I, I did find that a little annoying that you were saving over <laughs> yeah. the same name. Yeah. Okay. We're playing. Anyway, with that's it. that's the other way to, to fix that, I guess. So, and that's actually the yes. origin of the problem is that that, okay. that ch that's what changed. <laughs> okay. Older versions. Sense. So yeah, so here's where I stopped in R because now he says, okay, to do gradient descent, we're going to say that this object requires a gradient. And I was like, okay, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but you could have done it in torch though, with torch yeah, R. Maybe, yeah. I don't know how, I never used it, but. Um, so the coefficients, right, require a gradient. And we're gonna change those values. And um, let's see, we have our loss now has this gradient uh, property, I believe. And so the backward, yeah, now you can calculate the backward. Oh, no, what happened? Broke something. Oh, because I ran it too many times. Okay, so here's the gradient. Okay, I believe. And yeah, you can see they're roughly on the same scale. And then you just have to keep repeating that process. All right, so we calculate the loss for specific coefficients. We go backwards and then we can get the gradient values. Okay, and then I don't remember all this coefficients. Okay, this is where we're updating the coefficients, right? So we're moving along the gradient uh, with the step size. Okay. Okay. And then, yeah, then you just you go to fast AI to train the model. So again, I feel like the from scratch thing is a little hand wavy, but okay. <laughs> um, it's like, I'm yeah, going so cookies from scratch. That looks like a mix to me. <laughs> yeah. Pay no attention oh, to yeah. that. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we split the data here now, and then um, I guess we are defining our own update and one epoch. So we update, this is what we saw before. We move along the gradient with our learning rate. Now we can specify our learning rate. Uh, and then one epoch of the neural network goes through this updating. Okay. Some yeah. people pointed out in the comments that there is a, this is different than what he did in the video because that, see that grad zero, he didn't do that. He forgot oh. to zero the gradients in the the lecture, but okay. Wait, what's that for? The zeroing the gradient? Yeah, because if you don't do that, then every time you call backward, it'll just keep adding the gradients on and on. And oh. on. Yeah, I see, like accumulate them, right? I don't know why yeah. it does okay. that, but that's there must be a reason. Maybe okay, I used to know. And then we have a print statement to print the loss. This is the initialization all what we've seen and then training the model we're going to do multiple epochs and we have this learning rate and this is a little weird i just noticed this the seed is defined inside the function without specifying a way to change it <laughs> i would probably make that an argument here um okay and then this is it this is a Looks like train the model 18 learning rate point two. That would oh, show the coefficient. Oh, this is not the coefficient. What is this printing here? Do we know? That's the loss as it goes down, right? Ah, oh yeah, the loss. Loss. Okay. All the way to point two eight nine. And then he said, okay, we have these coefficients. We can 
see if they make sense to us. Um, so this is for survival. So age has a negative effect on survival and being a male has a negative effect. Save the women and children, I guess. Um, everything else. Fair doesn't really have much. Yeah. Positive. I think this is something, key art, something about the family. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, I think right. par parents maybe? I don't know. Really. Yeah. yeah. So if you have your family, you might survive better. The accuracy um, for the output being binary, you can um, specify a cutoff to say if it's a zero or one. Um, I don't know if he actually, if we did the sigmoid yet. I no, that's next. Anywhere. Yeah, that's okay. Next. I was going to say, this doesn't really make sense. 0.5 here. Um, okay. So 78% accuracy without using the sigmoid. All right. Okay, and yeah, and then now we're introducing the sigmoid, uh, but I don't think I have this. What did I do? Um, I don't know what this is. I'll just ignore it. We know what a sigmoid looks like, <laughs> right? Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay. Accuracy. Okay. Um. So this one, now that we have the sigmoid, so the sigmoid is the transformation of the output of our hidden layer before. Yeah, it's just going to transform the output from the linear space to the between um, zero, and, zero and one. Okay. In statistics, right, you might see this called like the inverse logistic, right? <laughs> okay. Here, now that we have it on this, this zero one scale, we have a lower loss and training. Oh, I already ran that. We have, now we have different, um, some different coefficients. Some of these, now this is reverse what we had on the other one. Negative. Okay, and then all this code is automated submission to Kaggle. I'm not gonna do this, but um, here, Looks like he, oh yeah, so we didn't have any, any NAs on FAIR, I believe in the training, but in the testing there is, so we just filled it with zero. Um, and then for the other NAs, he uses the modes. Um, although- Yeah, it's, that's one of those kind of lazy, lazy fixes again, right? Yeah. Saying this doesn't Although, really matter. I was seeing some discussion on his notebook about he answered the question. Where was it? Here. Okay, yeah. So this syntax means we're using the modes from the training set. Um and his sort of justification is we train the model with the modes meaning i mean i guess you have the ones that we're not missing it's a, but yeah it's a daily you also control, have right? it yeah meaning missing um so it could be important to use the same mode if they yeah. learn that that means it's missing i don't know well no it's also um, a data leakage problem right you always want to use the same transformations yeah, on, a, yeah. on the tests that you use for the training yeah um, I think he did mention in the video, but he didn't do here that you, instead of maybe this roundabout way of 
saying like the model might learn the missing based on your imputation. You could just have an indicator that says, you know, if this variable was missing or not. Um, okay. All right. Um, matrix products. Oh yeah, I guess matrix multiplication here is the at symbol. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And then here we add another layer, layer two. Okay. And let's see. Yes, and there's a constant now in the second layer. Um, just initializing both layers uh, weight. Then we have the activation function. So the um, first layer into the second has a relu and then from the second layer to the output, we have the sigmoid again. Okay, and so now here it looks like instead of calling, yeah, so instead of calling the COA, we just now have for every layer, we're doing the same thing we were doing before. Updating in the direction of the gradient with the learning rate. Yeah, so be easy to read, thankfully. Uh, we didn't do any better than our <laughs> one layer sigmoid. All right. That looks worse, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quite it's a bit worse. worse. The other one was like point 0.1 in training. I mean, you could try a different learning rate or something. Yeah, the accuracy was like 78. Yeah. Maybe try like a hundred or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then this section I think just generalizes it to. Yeah, you can have multiple, more than two layers. Yeah, so we're using the um, list comprehension, right? Instead of manually defining, right? We have up here, um, layer one, layer two. We have the layers defined with list comprehension based on the sizes that we provide in the beginning. Pretty cool. Um, again, yeah, now everything is just building up. So we're now moving across all of the layers. Okay. But it's the same, same thing. <laughs> Follow the gradients in the direction. All right. And nothing did not do any better. Yeah, I think the learning rate's really too low. I don't know why. <laughs> oh, four? You think that's too low? Yeah, try like 50. 50? <laughs> I don't know. It's a shot. <laughs> Is that gonna make it oscillate? Before wasn't it smaller? I think it was smaller. Where was the good one earlier? Oh yeah, I guess this one says a hundred. Oh yeah, you're right. It was a hundred. All right. Let's try it. No. <laughs> Never mind. Not Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I made it myself. So I guess the note I had a couple of bullet points from this. Yeah, so it's some of his thoughts that we talked about a little bit start Jeremy's opinion, start lazy, and then you can always tune it later. And then I think this was brought up actually in the first meeting we had that generally for tabular data, 
um, just throwing an architecture on it isn't going to do well like it can for images, but a lot of the work needs to go into this into the feature engineering of the matrix before you put it in the model. Um, and then he talked briefly about using a framework. Honestly, I didn't really follow that part very much. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I kind of skimmed past that too. Yeah. And then he briefly started on the random forest, which I think I will probably just present next week anyway because we don't have anyone signed up <laughs> okay so this is in chapter nine of the book um i'm not really sure why random forest well i guess it makes sense why they're in tabular data um so he th starts talking a little bit about um how random forests work where is it here this is so random forest right our decision tree uh, they're actually an ensemble of decision trees and yeah you can um basically you can look at all of the values you have for a variable in your data and start saying okay if i split on this one what will be my loss and then um for this one or this one and it can do that um pretty quickly. I've never had a problem really running random forest model. Um, so here's an example for the Titanic, or I guess this is not from Titanic, but you could imagine some data set classification problem of a person if they're fit or, or unfit. Um, you can make a cut point at 30 for their age, and then yeah, you just follow the tree. Um, here, yeah, so these were the basic sets that he mentioned. Um, and we can, we'll talk more about it next week. But yeah, so you basically, you go through each column of the data set and you look at the possible levels that you can cut at. All right. It's kind of all he really talked about. Uh, let me stop sharing for a second. And the other good thing, or I wouldn't say good, the other powerful thing about random forest is the ensembling so and the out of bag um, building I'm not sure how much he'll get into that next week but that that should be on the discussion anyway um, how familiar are you all with those concepts Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. Forest is, oh, yeah. it's so easy, right? I mean, I think Jeremy talks about yeah. that. Like, you don't really have to do much work. It's hard to screw it up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, use it quite yeah. a bit. Yeah, I think they're great as well. Oh, um, Andrew's here. Yeah, hey Andrew. Sorry, just uh, joined in. Yeah, snuck in. <laughs> yeah, snuck no in. Worries. Sorry. Did you have any questions? No, no, I, I actually, re I actually looked into, I didn't watch the video. I went, so I, I, I was surprised the chapter four showed up again. Uh, that was oh. the thing that we did before. Uh, and uh, earlier you were saying something about the gradient being equal to zero, right? You have to zero it out. It's done differently in chapter four. So mm. it can, it can get a, it calls it yeah it terms, changed how it works terms underscore grad equals none or something like that yeah they changed that I mean you still could do yeah. that I think but they changed that <laughs> in, in torch yeah that's, so I, that's annoying it's that, extremely it, annoying. right because the book the book came out what yeah a few years ago before the, before the videos yeah so it it can get annoying I think if you if you it it you know you read the book and then you watch the video yeah yeah. Chapter nine, there are some, I think this is also a bit hand wavy, I think for, for some, and, uh, but there are a couple of things that might be of interest, like, uh, his comments about, uh, data cleaning. So earlier Ron talks about data leakage, right? About these missing values. You'll see an example there, uh, if you want to learn more, uh, but the more interesting thing there is uh, he talks about the fact that uh,
do modeling first, then do data mm-hmm. cleaning, then model again, which I think, I, I don't know, it it feels a bit different from the way I'm used to. Usually yeah. I would do data cleaning first, uh, think about the model, and then afterwards actually do the estimate. The model. Doesn't he talk about that in one of the earlier videos? I th- I, that does sound yeah. familiar. I remember him saying Very something about video. that. Very first video. Very right, first video, yeah. right. Because he image, shows image how, classification. right. Right, because he uses the model to help him identify problem data, which mm-hmm. is a good idea, right? But you're right. Normally, you think, "Oh, I'm going to clean up my data first, and then I'm going to go through." But he uses the model to help him, yeah, clean the data. Which yeah, you have to be it's, I mean, <laughs> it's, it, I guess it's useful, right? Like, yeah. yeah, if the computer can help you figure out, yeah, yeah, uh, your outliers, then. It shows up again. It shows up again there, uh, okay. in the context of finding, uh, sort of like distinguishing whether or not you have a validation date. The the row is a member of a valid of the validation oh, set right. test data. So that's right. also something that is curious, no? Curious to see. Right. So you he know, trains. Know. What he yeah. tries to do is train a model to see if it can detect whether a, a, a row is part of the test or the val or the yes. training set or whatever, right? Exactly. And if it can, then there's potentially a problem with how you're splitting up your data. That's what that was about, right? Yeah. 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 That, that is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool uh, I don't know if there's a lot of work in statistics that that exploits that. Uh, you know, uh, this idea or assesses that idea. Another thing that might be of interest in chapter nine is uh, uh, he there's a part where he kind of mixes prediction and causal kind of stuff like oh. why and prediction. So <laughs> I, I that's my reading, but ha- have a yeah. look. Uh, it, it, there, there are lots of things here and there that uh worthy of, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, nit- nitpicking. No, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. There. <laughs> so just to be aware, the next section is also going to be using chapter nine as main reference, I think. So we don't have yes. to necessarily uh-huh. completely cover chapter so nine. So unless yet. anyone here really wants to present random forest, I will just take it. I, um, I haven't presented yet, so I can I can oh, put my okay. name in the hat for great. next week. Great. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. That'd be awesome. Um yeah, there put was some right now. Okay, yeah, go for it. There was some, when I changed, I guess we can probably stop the video now since we're going to do housekeeping.